Welcome to tonight's Duke Reads. I'm Frank Stacio, host of the State of Things on North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. Tonight, Sue Waslick, known at, to, at Duke as Dean Sue, uh, will be with us for tonight's Duke Reads, To Kill a Mockingbird. Dean Sue has worked in the Division of Student Affairs at Duke University. Uh, during this time, she served as the assistant to the Dean for Student Life, Dean for Student Life, currently the Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students. Her areas of responsibility and oversight have included new student orientation, judicial affairs, residential life, parent programs, fraternity and sorority life, disability services, leadership development, mediation, crisis response, and a number of other duties as assigned as if there was anything left. Most recently, she has assumed oversight of student health counseling and psychological services and the Wellness Center. She served for more than 25 years as academic advisor to freshmen and sophomores and has taught courses in education, law, and cultural anthropology. She completed three degrees from Duke, a Bachelor's of Arts, Master's of Health and Hospital Administration, and a Master's of Law. She received her JD from North Carolina Central University, a Doctor of Education from the University of Pennsylvania, and she recently co-authored a book entitled Getting the Best Out of College. Dean Sue chose to kill a mockingbird because, quote, each of the characters taught me many life lessons, and I felt the book's 50th anniversary provided a unique opportunity to revisit this classic literary work. Dean Sue, great to have you in the program. Thank you so much. Good to much. be here, Frank. Thank you. Let's get right into the discussion. Number one, you ask, why is Atticus such a highly regarded person in the community? How come? Um, he just seems to say all the right things and do all the right things uh, at the right time. Uh, he comes across to me as just being this incredibly loving and caring father um, and would do anything for his children. And uh, he, he, just, he just embodies goodness, you know, when I, when I think of him in, in this role. It's an interesting thing, and, and he comes across as a very wise, you know, as you said, wise fellow, and obviously well-respected in the community, in, in the various communities, because I think we'll get into the, the caste right. system and the social order in, in town. But he does well in all of those communities, too. He does. Um, and, you know, the fact that he has, he's a widow, um, and the fact that uh, he has this black woman, Calpurnia, taking care of yeah. his children and treats her um, with such incredible respect and relies on her in ways that he knows that she is influencing his children um, and, and lets her do that because he, he too respects and trusts her beyond beyond uh, in, in incredible limits as far as I'm concerned. You know, and I know we're talking about the book, but the, the movie has done so much to print the images of uh, Harper Lee's story on our mind. Uh, Gregory Peck, of course, played Atticus Finch. And Harper Lee really is said to have loved him, is quoted as saying, you know, he really embodied the character mm -hmm. and understood the role. So I, but the, I guess my point is, I guess we're all forgiven if we see Gregory Peck when we read this book. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I can't think of Atticus without thinking about Gregory Peck. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, they are one and the same as far as I'm concerned. And it's interesting because I didn't go back and watch the movie um, in preparing mm -hmm. for this. I did reread the book, of course, but I didn't go back and watch the movie. And I almost wish I had because I, I would like to, I would like to be able to get the images of the other characters in my mind as strongly as I have Gregory Peck in my head as, as Atticus. Um, but I don't recall what the other, what the other characters look like. Yeah, well, and, and it's interesting, too, that, that the book is written so well that, honestly, you wouldn't... I mean, you these characters right. are, you know, really come to life in a way that's pretty powerful. You know, there's been, been some... Certainly an observation and at times criticism that the book was written in two parts. There's mm -hmm. Jem and Scout and Dill, you know, exploring the mystery of Boo Radley and then the story of Tom and the trial. And that this and some critics have said they didn't think those two stories came together well. How do you feel about that? I don't know that it matters whether they come together well. I mean it didn't for me and it's frankly not something that I've I've really thought long and hard about. Um, I, I think the themes that they represent come together beautifully, and that is just, you know, how we treat others, how we view other people, how we look for the best in other human beings. And I think in that way, 
the two stories and the two story lines blend very nicely. Okay. Um, and, and I think that's what makes the book so powerful because that message comes across loudly and clearly throughout yeah. the book. I agree completely. I think you see exactly those themes represented in both stories, and they are brought together, particularly in the end when Boo right. makes makes his uh, his return. Well, let's take a look because, as always, we invite your comments via email. And let's take one right now from Felicia, who's in Valencia, California. She said, "I was glad to see the solitary work by Harper Lee is still relevant in today's global society. It is core reading for high school freshmen in California, but at times." Uh, no, but the times, setting, attitude, and social interactions always seem foreign to my ninth grade students. I enjoy teaching this novel and delving into its historical significance as one raised in the South with a very different perspective and a, a different experience than most of my students. It's an interesting comment um, because I, I read this book and I think it's as relevant today as it was when it was written 50 years ago. And no matter when I have picked this book up and read it, I have always felt that level of relevance. So I'm, I'm struck by that comment that her students don't see that relevant. But it makes me, I, mean, I don't mean to change the subject here, but um, it makes me think about um, a film that I show in the class that I teach. It's called A Hero for Daisy, and it's about Title IX and the experience of the Yale women's rowing team in 1976. And I show that film, that documentary film, and I just think it's so powerful and it just speaks to equal rights for women. Mm -hmm. And many of the students in my class just walk away saying, well, I don't, I don't, that was a fine story, but why, why is that relevant to me mm -hmm. today? So we're missing something there between how the students are interpreting this book, the movie that I mentioned. But for me, I, I don't resonate with that comment at all. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, certainly, uh, Felicia does, and her students walk away not always understanding the context. I think for them, the notion of segregation is, is preposterous and sort of unimaginable. Um, I, I always wonder how it wasn't unimaginable. Mm -hmm. How did we imagine it when we were sort of growing up? But, but it's that. It's the setting. It's a place in the South where that kind of a thing could happen. And I think for your students, perhaps a, a, a time when it was possible that women had to fight for this sort of thing. Yeah. And I, I think you're absolutely right about that. And, and then I think about California and maybe the whole notion of diversity. And uh, it's, it, California is different. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and yet we know that there are many who are very concerned about the resegregation of our schools. Right. So right. I hear what she's saying. I hear what you're saying. Um, I still think the book's relevant. Oh, it's absolutely relevant. And what we're able to see, it seems to me, is people who are forced to confront their diversity um, in ways that maybe we're not these days, and maybe that's part of our sorrow and our grief. We're able to, uh, to silo our differences. Um, I've seen some great critiques on the word tolerance, mm -hmm. which is used as a code word for you leave me alone and I'll right. you leave you alone. But it means that we're not really c communicating and becoming one society. And, and the word tolerance was the word that we used for many, many years. That was an acceptable term to mm -hmm. use. And now we are hoping that we go well beyond the notion of tolerance. Um, and I think we, in many ways, are making strides. But... Uh, Again, I read this book, and, and, and I do get a bit sad to think that this could still happen, maybe mm. not in exactly this way and not in as egregious a way that we see people persecuted um, and prosecuted, uh, but, but it's troubling. It's still troubling. Well, and it also seems that some of the psychological underpinnings, the things that cause people to resent others within a society may be very much with us today. If you think about Tom Ewell, um, Bob Ewell, the Ewell family, uh, their place in this society as poor white people whose only hope, right, of any kind of recognition is to make sure that they maintain their one step above the African American population. This kind of social order isn't an accident. And so keeping people pitted Against, against each, each other, other right. this way, who are at the bottom of the economic and social order, um, is still very much with us. And those resentments are still, I think, uh, 
deeply felt in our political process. I think process. the other thing that's interesting about the, the Ewell family and their role in this book is that it not only highlights that racial divide and that, that gap and that hierarchy, but it also speaks to gender issues as well within the, the white families and, and all the families and, and uh, the gender issues at that period of time in history. May Bell really didn't have a lot of choices. Um, no, she didn't. And and as I read about her, there were so many things that I, I sort of felt that she was sort of on the verge of being courageous in some ways. You know, stepping out of that the cage that she was in and and doing and saying things that were not acceptable. And and yet that was her only escape. You know and. Um, so I, I had great sympathy and empathy for her. One of the things, as you said that, I wondered to myself, where are the role models? Where's Atticus' model for, for his kind of mm -hmm. courage? Uh, where would Maybell's model be for some other kind of identity? See, right. Right? I mean, it's just not there. She, her, she's told what, how to act by the men around her who are told by the, the people the next rung up right. where your place is. Um, that's a pretty rough social order, yeah. ensconced in this kind of religiosity too. We, you know, we sort of get the um, the role of the pious right. religious women in this. <clears throat> but there, are, I mean, I think the I think many of the women in this book are great heroes. Um, you know, well, certainly scout. scouts. Scouts, <laughs> I mean, scouts just the best. Yeah. Um, and I remember reading this book uh, in ninth grade or high school or, or whatever, and just falling in love with Scout. I wish I could be like her. You know, I I remember thinking to myself, I wish I could just, you know, sort of step out of this role and 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 be who I wanna be sometimes. Cause she was just she could she just defied what everyone wanted her to do and wanted her to be. What, and the, but those but all out of a sense of innocence. I mean not like Absolutely. her father kind of standing right. up for justice right. in that way. And that's what made her so refreshing. You know, she was just, and and yet, I and I get I get visions in a picture of her. I can't remember her face, but <clears throat> from the movie. But what I remember most vividly is um, those tender moments where she would sort of step out of that. I'm this tough tomboy type, um, and you can't mess with me, and I'm going to beat you up. And and you just imagine her. Well, I don't have to imagine. I remember in the movie her extending her hand to Boo, you know, come with me, or grabbing his arm, and, um, and, and you know, I just remember reading, I want to be like that. <clears throat> you know, I want to be able to be tough, and I also want to be able to be that caring <clears throat> and compassionate person. Um, yeah, I thought she was the best. And we catch her, Harper Lee, of course, reflects this child coming of age. She's, she's making this discoveries, right. these discoveries on the fly, and we're watching her sort of grow and mature, but not calcify, not become a hardened you know, segregationist. Why don't we move on to the second <clears throat> question. Why, uh, what does Atticus do to shape his children's character? Yeah. Well, I think we've already sort of touched on this a little bit already, but um, uh, he's, he's just what I would call a good man, a good person. Um, and he, as you mentioned before, his wisdom and uh, he he led. He he was a leader of the family without being a, a dictator. Um, he he enabled, I think, his children to really learn uh, by their mistakes. You know, he he had them reined in, but not so tightly that they couldn't fail, and then and then learn um, learn from as I said from their mistakes. Uh, I think. In the book, some of the things that he would say were just so powerful. Um, you know, you, you don't know what another person's life is like unless you've been in their skin or you've walked in their shoes. And, and that sounds, so, sounds like such an easy thing to say and to understand, but it was when he said it and sort of how he said it that I think made him such an incredible role model for his mm -hmm. children. Um, you know, they got frustrated with him. They got irritated with him. They were occasionally angry, and they mocked him at times, and they wondered how the community viewed him and, you know, our silly father, and why does he do it this way? But they absolutely adored and loved and respected him. And um, I, I think there are some lessons, great lessons mm -hmm. to be learned in parenting 
and leadership from, from Atticus. Oh, yeah. I mean, in particular, when you see also his obvious love for his children mm -hmm. and this need, I mean, he, he's, he's alone. They're all he's got. And, but in those moments when he must, he does risk their friendship to create the boundaries. So while he lets them grow and lets them make mistakes, there are certain things you may not do. You may not talk to Calpurnia that way. Right. Th there's no, it's well, this is not a debate <laughs> now. And I will right. risk your wrath and right. you're never speaking to me again. But this lesson mm -hmm. you, you must learn. And to kill a mockingbird, of course, the, making the distinction between the, the blue jays and the, and the mockingbird. Right. There, were, there were rules, you know. That makes him a great dad. <laughs> yeah, he, I mean, it does. And he drew the line, but he, he always seemed to know when and where yeah. to draw that line. And how to get it across. Uh, Joanne from Cary uh, has this for question two. He leads by example. He talks to his children and people of all races and social status with respect. And he has consequences for his children's actions. Uh, Jerry's reading to Mrs. Du Bois, uh, Dubose, uh, although... He said, was it Mrs. Dubois? Yeah. Um, although he said he would have found another reason for Jeb to read to her so that he could gain respect and knowledge of how she fought to remain free of morphine during her last days. Um, he expects his children to treat everyone with respect, teaches them to read, and speaks eloquently to them, provides life lessons to them that Scout later discovers when she's older. I think that's a good It's a point great too. summary. It's yeah. a great summary, yeah. And, and the notion that you're really going to, that the, the wisdom is going to take a while to sink in. And so he doesn't really need to, to hammer it home to convince you. He knows he's made his point, and it may take 10 years for you to come yeah. to it. I think one of the interesting relationships in the book um, that I haven't really thought a lot about until just, just listening to that description is Atticus's relationship with Jim. Because I, I feel like I have a better sense of his relationship with Scout mm -hmm. than I do with Jim. And I don't know if you have thought about that, if, you, if you've got a sense of sort of oh, how he felt his relationship was different with Jim, or was it different? You know, it's interesting. I hadn't thought much about it either. I mean, clearly Harper Lee would like us to focus on that, that particular relationship. So you're right. Um, yeah. It's, it's yeah, I, and I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I asked you because I don't know what I think. I, I really, yeah. It's just a little, little different. Um, and Jim to me was, I don't want to call him a mystery um, because he certainly wasn't a mysterious character, right. but I never felt as connected right. to him as I did to several of the other characters. Uh, but one of the things that does come through is Atticus' anxiety about right. having to be the only parent right. to a girl, to a young woman. Um, that was clear, that that's a, that was a stress. So you're likely to see more drama in their relationship, right. I think, than right. one that's much more natural. natural. I'll just yeah. do this, you do that after me, and that's how you hold the wood, not follow me. Right. Um, but it is a good question. I haven't thought about it too deeply. Let's go on to question number three. What role does the yeah. loss of innocence play in this novel? Well, that's, that's what the book is all about. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess, in many ways, Atticus doesn't want his children to lose their innocence. He knows it's inevitable. Mm -hmm. I think he tries to sort of guide that in particular ways. Um, I, we know that the mockingbird is the symbol of, of innocence, and you don't shoot the mockingbird. So you really don't want that innocence to ever die. You always want it to, to be alive and well. Um, and I think going back to the first question and why Atticus, Atticus was such a good father, I think that the way that he was able to shepherd his children sort of through that loss of innocence um, and to make certain it didn't happen too quickly, it didn't happen in a dramatic way, um, you know, I think that also lends itself to, to really speak to his character and to his role as a, a great father. And I don't think, and one, one of the criticisms when you see any of the book at all was that the characterization of Atticus was um, um, a little bit too glossy, a little bit too... Sappy or too yeah, good? And a little yeah. Un, yeah, too yeah. good. Unrealistic. Too good. Unrealistic. Or, yeah. I, I think in a lot of ways, I mean, when you think about his, the scene when he has to confront the, the mad dog. Mm -hmm. right? This is something he does not want, want to, to do. do. It's not 
his job and he alone and it has to be done and and, and of course I mean, in terms of symbolism and allegory that that goes in a thousand directions um, but there were moments when he's in tension with his own responsibilities and he's not sure what to do that's not a perfect man I mean he struggles right. with how to how to manage these I think what makes him if there's anything that makes him unrealistic to me it's his calmness mm. um, and maybe we don't or maybe I don't feel the calmness in the book as much as you do in the movie mm. you know because Gregory Peck is just sort <laughs> of right. this you know calm very just level-headed um, I mean he, he does show his anger at times mm. and his emotion but it's at those occasions when any of us would but mm. at times when many of us would lose control he doesn't right. and uh, I think that's part of the question you know is he for, is he for real right. can we really trust that and maybe that's the thing we can't understand about being a man a white man of privilege in that context okay. in that place um, you either are that way or you become that way because you've got to get along in that town there's a lot of people you tipped your hat to. There are a lot of people who have excuses for whatever morphine they use. and So um, it may not be a, an insight into how they get there. We just find it unbelievable mm -hmm. because we, you know, we've never been, been in that context. We are taking your questions, as always, as we consider with Dean Sue To Kill a Mockingbird, Harper Lee's classic. Um, and of course, always sad that she never published another book. We're, we're sort of always speculating on what that why next that, book right. would have been and why not and all of that. Um, well, I have to say she did a pretty good job on the one yeah. and only. <laughs> I'm not going to be too critical of her because I think she, she, uh, she yeah. made a difference in my life with this book. So I'll speak to that. How old were, do you? How old were I, you, you know, you I recall it? middle school, late middle school, early high school. It was, it was somewhere mm -hmm. in there. Um, and it was uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina is where I was growing mm -hmm. up. Um, my family had moved from the north in the early 60s. And uh, so I vivid re vividly recall still some segregated right. facilities and services. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this, this spoke volumes to me, this book did. Did it, did it move you as both literature and narrative? In other words, the story is profound and you certainly identified closely with Scout but were you already open to literature had your mind already yes and no yeah um, to be perfectly blunt and honest uh -huh. about it I, I think I was still developing sort of that that love of literature I loved to read yeah. I mean I read everything I could get my hands on but a lot of it was um, I was able to start and finish something mm -hmm. you know a book mm -hmm book had a beginning and an end right. and so it provided a sense of accomplishment to me right. and, and that was something that felt good. Um, I did not have a lot of confidence in my ability to read a book and analyze it. Mm. I can remember being expected to go to class and be called upon to talk about the symbolism and the metaphors mm. and the themes and what did this mean and I I, um, I resorted to cliff notes a mm -hmm. lot. <laughs> I hate to admit that um, at this stage in my life, but it's true. Yeah. And I think it wasn't until even college and post-college where I began to develop a, a greater confidence in my reading of a book. So reading this as an adult and even reading it most recently to prepare for this program, um, I feel like my, my literary sophistication has, uh, has risen a bit. And it should. <laughs> it's a good book to teach in schools. You only hope it's being taught well, uh, because if you if you put too fine a point on any of this, it can it can be difficult for children. Or, as you experienced, mm -hmm. just the pressure of having to come up with, with something this. can kind of turn yeah. you the other way. I think for this book, I mean, this book had a lot of characters. Yeah. There were a number of characters, and you could sit and try to analyze them and figure out what they symbolized and what their purpose mm -hmm. was in the book. And and so from that standpoint. I, I think the book was somewhat intimidating for me when I first read it. Um, this time around, it, it didn't yeah. feel that way. Well, and it's also the kind of book that you do come back to, you know, sort of every five years. And, and see. you can read it, and, yeah. and you can watch that movie time and time again yeah. and still feel very moved by it. Um, let's take a look at our other questions. I know we have many. Uh, here's a question from Carrie in Charlotte. 
in a world where some school systems are banning books that teach morals based on past errors, and bullying is still a huge problem, at what stage do you think this book should be introduced to students? I read it in the sixth grade. Uh, it was instrumental in the formation of my ideas of right and wrong in the world. I still remember feelings I had when I read the book with universal themes in this book uh, will never lose its impact mm -hmm. if we allow it to be taught. We just talked about that. But but there is a question in there. What do you think is yeah. the appropriate grade level? Well, Carrie said she read it in the sixth grade. I yeah. want to say I read it in the eighth or the ninth grade. Mm -hmm. I think the perfect time today would be in middle school. Mm -hmm. I don't think that the students necessarily will get all the literary no. aspects of the book, but I do think the messages mm -hmm. Um, are very powerful and probably best taught at that age and best discussed at that age. Yeah, I, I would even think, yes, in middle school, certainly, and then again in high school. Yeah, and maybe and make again that a deliberate, in college. And then again in college <laughs> and make that kind of a deliberate yeah. effort to, to uh, not only get into it more deeply, but to, as a way of measuring your change mm -hmm. as a reader, sort of how, how things have changed for you. Um, I think we should do that with more books, to be honest, but particularly books that are so powerful that the story is so well told. Yeah, and it's, you know, you have to hand it to her for writing something that has sustained its right. significance uh, for 50 years. And uh, I know there are a lot of books that, that do, but uh, I, I think this one in particular really is, is remarkable in that way. Interesting commentary on this book. There's been little, uh, I think more now in the, as we come on the 50th anniversary, but up until then, little literary criticism. And there's a thought that because it was such a commercial success, you know, critics just kind of stayed away from it, mm -hmm. assuming that, well, it, it couldn't be good literature. It's too right, popular. Right. And that's a shame. Yeah, and I completely disagree with that. Yeah. But, yeah. Question from Martha in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania. Can Dean Sue elaborate on her comment that each of the characters taught her many life lessons? So, will each of the characters? Yeah, what well, lessons, we have. What I've got a list of all the characters here, but um, well, you can give us the top four <laughs> <laughs> and the lessons you learned. Yeah, I, you know, um, and, I, and I think I've alluded to some of this already. For me, uh, the the women in the book were interesting. Um, you know, to me, um, I'm trying to think. I want to make sure I get their names correct here, but I think comparing someone like um, Calpurnia, clearly a mother figure, to uh, the aunt. I can't mm -hmm. remember the aunt's name. Suddenly it's... Uh, I'm not going to remember all the characters. Yeah, I yeah. can't remember her name. And I'm looking at my list and it's still not helping me. But I think we know, you know, the aunt that came in to help yeah. be another female uh, right. figure in the, in the household. Uh, you know, I... I had greater respect for Calpurnia's way of approaching raising Scout and raising Jim than I certainly did from the aunt. So th when I talk about life's lessons, those are sort of things, you know, how, and I don't have any children, but I, I work with college students on a day-to-day -day basis, and I, and I wonder, you know, what is the right way to, to help rear a child right. today? You know, how do you do that? How, what's the best way to influence a young person's decision making and their choices and and so as I was comparing those two women in this book I thought for me Calpurnia is going to have a her approach is going to have a much greater impact or would have had a much greater impact on me as a young person than the aunt figure um, so that that was sort of one one example uh, the other thing I I know that the law the legal system lawyers are certainly a highly criticized profession, a highly criticized field, and yet we've got some pretty um, good mm -hmm. participants in the criminal justice system in this book. Clearly Atticus is one. Um, the judge does sort of mm -hmm. all that he can, I think, right. uh, given the environment and, and the political uh, landscape to, to really, I think, do the right thing. Um, it, it gave me sort of more hope and faith in our own legal system. It made me rethink the characters and, and who participates and, and what the, what their roles are. How, as a lawyer, how does Atticus hold up as a lawyer? How does he look to you as a, as a bona fide attorney? Well, I think, um, I, I think that's probably, it's interesting that you ask that. It's, I think that's probably another thing that makes him a little bit unrealistic, hmm. is that he, he, 
he comes across as so pure. And I don't want to say that attorneys aren't honest mm -hmm. and filled with integrity. But as an attorney, you're expected to represent mm -hmm. your client with zeal, with zealousness. You know, that's right. what you're taught to do. And sometimes in doing that, as an attorney, you are, someone could be accused of crossing the line or not mm -hmm. being as honest as they should be. Atticus just never did that. You know, he never crossed any line. He was always completely and totally above board. Mm -hmm. Um, but I thought I found him to be completely refreshing as an attorney. Um, well, and that's one of the one of the other sort of deeper themes for me that has resonated so deeply. There's the obvious social um, um, cues and themes of social justice and the law, and very well handled. But these deeper themes that we all wrestle with, because we have so many identities mm -hmm. and we're restricted by so many social constructions, that's right. That's right. right? And so all of these things that they're facing, Boo in his trap, in his prison, reaching out in the way he does, um, the, the two kids at first acting like kids but coming to a deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. So everybody sort of burrows deep to the subterranean place where they exist as individuals and then they begin to see how everybody, everybody else, else is in that mm -hmm. place and then they look up at this edifice that's been built in this particular edifice in the south um, and you get that view you suddenly get that look up at this thing you know this this th that's a kind of a trap mm -hmm. I, I want to go back to the question about what I learned from some of the other characters um, I think it, with many of the characters, and we know who they are, you know, Bob Ewell probably being at the top of the list, but I learned from a number of characters just how I would never want to be. You know, I would mm -hmm. never, mm -hmm. I hope I'm never perceived in that way. I hope I never find myself acting in that way and treating people in that way. It's such a simple thing, but um, it's, I think it's very, very powerful in this book. And I think it, if you read it carefully and slowly, and you reflect on what some of these characters do and say, we find ourselves in some of the bad people. It's hard to admit, but mm -hmm, it's true. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think so many of the, the evil characters really forced me to sit back and reflect. And that's, that was another sort of lesson that I learned from them. Um, again, I go back to Jim. I'm not sure what I learned from him. Um, he was, he was, to me, the most difficult character mm. to, to embrace and to identify with. Another question. Um, the reader views the community through the eyes of Jem and Scout, uh, who, through losing their innocence, are able to provide an adult's understanding of the town to the views of Atticus. This is a quote, you never really know a man until you mm. stand in his shoes and walk around in them. Most people are nice when you finally see them. At the conclusion, one sees Makem through Scout's unprejudiced eyes. This is talking about question three now, the loss of innocence. Treat people of all races with respect. If one observes inequities, take action to attempt to correct injustices. In some towns, Boo might be treated the same. In, other in others, mm -hmm. he'd hopefully get counseling, medication, uh, mental health treatment to help him deal with issues. So, um, you know, that's sort of a look at how we can... I guess the many aspects of, right. of the town. And, uh, yeah, Boo is a very interesting character as well. Um, and we don't know a whole lot about him. You know, we, uh, he's, uh, he's somewhat of a, a, of a mystery. And, you know, we talk about the resources that would potentially be made available to him in other places or today. And um, it, it's an interesting question. I wonder if those would be made available. It, right. it, you know, families have to be willing to avail themselves of those resources who would have sort of, you know, championed that effort for him. Um, I don't know. Maybe yeah. Atticus would have been more in a position to do that. I don't know. Well, and it's also um, an interesting view because Boo doesn't speak um, for most of the novel. You, you, what happens to a member of your society who is voiceless. They become the projection of everybody Real else's society. imagination. That's what And that's exactly what happened in the book, right? And that's what happened. And so, again, sort of this marvelous literary but um, skill mm -hmm. that she used to render those characters and the relationships. And it's a great story because that's what kids do, you know, so it's completely plausible. Um, 
and the fact that he does speak through his gifts. That that's how you know his heart, even though right. his needs, medical right. and otherwise, because he's not given a voice or anything. Right. You know, and that's you how know. you know that he understands. Yeah. That that's that he has a level of understanding, and that's that's his expression of that that understanding, yeah. and and it is his heart. Yeah. We can move on to question number four, which is, what can we take from this novel oh, today gosh. in terms of addressing race relations? How would Boo be treated? We talked yeah. a little bit about that, but race relations, um, you know, how's it going today? It's probably not like uh, make them, but... No, but, and I think the but yeah. is the, the real question here. Um, you know, I, I still have great hope and faith that race relations are moving in the right direction. Um, and I, I get that great hope and faith by working with young people on a day-to-day -day basis and seeing change and seeing uh, their outlook and their view as being very different than it was even 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. That being said, um, there are parts of To Kill a Mockingbird that still exist today. Which there parts are do aspects. you think? Um, I, I, well, we can talk about, you know, people who are in prison today. Mm -hmm. We can talk about uh, perhaps an assumption at times that certain races are more guilty than they really are. I mean, the numbers sort of speak to that, mm -hmm. statistically mm -hmm. do. Um, uh, you know, I think we can, um, we can look at the schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned that earlier. Are we, in fact, moving into... A period, of, or are we already in a period of resegregation of the schools? I mean, demographically, it's irrefutable that, that we that are resegregating our schools. schools somehow. Now, what the intention is, how that happened, that's all debatable, but these schools are resegregating. Yeah. And it's interesting that our elementary and secondary schools are resegregating, and yet at higher edu the level of higher education, we're all about diversifying our student mm -hmm. bodies and really working to make that happen. Um, and so that, that whole gap, that dichotomy, uh, that difference, I think, is even more pronounced today than, than perhaps it has been in the past. Um, Do we need to get to a deeper kind of engagement that goes beyond tolerance? Have we given ourselves a pa Have we allowed the diverse faces on our various campuses and in our communities um, to fool us into thinking that we really have an equitable society, that we're not doing the hard political work of, mm -hmm. of confronting the, the difficulties, the political challenges? Well, I, I do think we've moved beyond tolerance, at least in some places and in some ways. To say that that's happened across the country, I think, is you know, right. <laughs> erroneous and, and uh, naive. But I do think we have moved beyond tolerance. I think we... I think we have a deeper appreciation and understanding of, of, of just other human beings that are different from us, and that that's good, that's okay, difference isn't bad, we embrace that. And we don't so much look for the differences, we look for the commonalities, but we don't ignore the differences, because we shouldn't ignore the differences. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if I've made sense in saying all of that, but I think that's very different than just tolerance. Right, but it does suggest that we need maybe a, an uncomfortable conversation, some kind of uncomfortable mm -hmm. um, um, process that that takes us beyond congratulating ourselves for the accomplishments right. we've made um, and then sort of shrugging our shoulders at the obvious demographic differences, the economic differences as we see the, the growing gap between rich and poor um, and there is, a, there is a color correlation there as well so you think, well, hmm, can, can, we, can we afford to say, gosh, how did that happen? happen? Or do we yeah. have to really roll up our sleeves and, and kind of undo it? And is that, is that the next challenge for Atticus Finch? Is that sort of sitting in front of the, of the jail with your, with your rifle? Is that our next, what that looks like? You know? Yeah, Frank, you're asking <laughs> me to answer, answer right. questions yeah, that, answer that. Uh, you know, they're, they're too hard. They're things I think about but, uh, and struggle with, but I don't have all the answers. Um, let's go to number five. Who is your favorite character and why? I think I was going to ask you that question. <laughs> You're going to ask me that? Well, uh, it has, I, I mean, mine yeah, is yeah. Scout. Got to my, be Scout. My, my, yeah. Scout is my favorite. Yeah. Um, and I think I said earlier, I just think she's uh, 
She's a bold right. young lady, and uh, I liked I liked that about her. Yeah. Um, I liked her her sharp tongue. You know, I liked that little wickedness that she brought, and yet I always felt like she was she was really a good a good person. She had a uh, a great desire, I think, in the end to do the right thing. But she was going to do it her way. You know, and she right. was gonna, she was gonna do it her way, and she was gonna follow the path that she wanted to follow, and I loved that about her. Yeah, no, I, I mean, Scout is definitely. Is she your favorite too? Absolutely. I mean, she. Oh, gone it, Frank. I wanted you to pick somebody else. <laughs> can't do it. And and the good thing was, she's the female for me anyway. Was the female answer to or counterpart of Huck Finn, and that's mm -hmm. my, that's my most important book right. in the world. For about the same reasons, I'm watching a young man, and I was probably his age when I was reading it, uh, come of age and have his eyes opened up, but mm -hmm. not lose his innocence. So he kept having you know, that fresh, innocent look at what is preposterous and criminal at times. And she did the same thing. So I, you sort of love that, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, Angela's ashes in a lot of ways. I mean, that when you right, can maintain right. that voice right. and, and come of age before my eyes. Um, and I, I, I love the fact that she was a young woman doing that and, and her relationship with the father too was just for me always powerful yeah um, and and I loved all those things about her and and the thing that I loved my, and my second favorite would be Atticus I don't know who your second favorite is but um, what I loved about him and I mentioned this earlier before also was sort of his calmness yeah. just his ability to stay calm you know Scout would lose it you know she would she just couldn't control herself and and again that was very charming uh, but, but Atticus just was able to generally hold it all together, and I had great respect for that. He became more important to me as I became the father of a girl, and and watching him struggle yeah. with that sort of, and and you know, and and Joanne's been in the house, so I didn't have to bear the whole responsibility that whole time, which was great. But I will say that the struggle that you know of of a man sort of how do I now what what do, what I, do I do, do next? here right, right. how am I supposed to be for this girl you know um, so he was very important to me right. as, as and a and that awkwardness was another thing that sort of made him a little bit more right. reali realistic and a little bit more believable um, but even that didn't last very long he sort of figured out what he was going to do and, you know <laughs> always comes up with something yeah he always comes up with something he's... I'm looking for that where, where she talks about. Um, he tells her not to fight anymore because people right. are calling him names and he's, she's depending the family on her. And there was that sort of, okay, well, I won't fight then, but I will fight now. Right, you know? right. right. We had a response to that one too, number five, and that was... Yeah, did people tell who their favorites were? We got one. I'm going to find it here in a moment. thought I had it right in front of me. But it was a response to question number five. One of their favorites, here it is, Scout. She absorbs the wisdom with quick intellect of Atticus, also speaks her mind. She is, and I think this is all from Joanne from Kerry. Um, she's reflective. She looks back over the past few years. She recognizes how much Atticus knew about Jem and her actions. He wasn't stupid. No, he, he go. <laughs> she adapted to Calpurnia's friends at church. Mm -hmm. as well as her aunt's society women. Uh, she immediately liked book. Uh, she, she immediately liked book. Um, I, Scout, well, this is the, a quote from the book, led him to the front porch. He was still holding my hand and gave no sign of, of letting go. Boo whispered, will you take me home? Scout thought, I would lead him through our house, but I would never lead him home. Scout said, Mr. Arthur, bend your arm down here. Scout slipped her hand in the crook of his arm. Neighbors would see Arthur Radley escorting me, Scout, down the sidewalk mm -hmm. as any gentleman would do. I found this action to be mature and very moving. It's, uh, and, and that's, that's sort of the, the interesting thing about Scout because, you know, at some point in the book she's ready to fight, right. you know, and the other time she's thinking, I need to make Boo Radley look as good as I can. This is important. Mm. Um, you know, I'm, I'm proud, and he needs to be proud. And I, I say that in the most positive way, you sure. know. And this, I want folks to look at this and say, that's the way it should be, mm. and I'm going to make sure it's, it is that way. So she, 
she's uh, she's just the greatest. I, I really like her. She is, and you get the sense, as as Joanne said, that she absorbed Atticus' lessons, um, almost as a gift to him. His sensing his his anxiety about, am I doing this right? I mean, it's almost like, okay, Dad, watch. Right. I got it. I got it, you yeah. Know, and, and this is my gift to you. And you've Relax. done good. <laughs> you've done good, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, what, what's shocking about this is that all of these sort of faint criticisms about perhaps it's too glossy and too perfect, it's, it's her story, mm -hmm. you know, and it's very autobiographical. I mean, obviously, you can shine it up a bit, but um, to think that this was autobiographical and to, to know now that Dill was Truman Capote. Capote, yeah. That's kind of a kind of a thrilling sort of p part of this story. Um, how how important is all of that? How important to this story is our, the, the common knowledge that it's mostly true, or based loosely on her relationship anyway with the father, and that there's this famous writer kind of lurking about in, in the story. Well, I didn't other, know. You know, I never things. knew that when I first read the mm -hmm. book. Um, it wasn't until you know years later that I even had any notion or idea that that was, you know, the mm. truth. So for me, it didn't matter. Right. It didn't matter that it was true. It didn't matter that it in any way tracked Harper, Harper Lee's life. It didn't matter that Truman Capote may have influenced this book in minimal or major mm -hmm. ways. You know, who knows? Um, it's, it's nice to know now. It's interesting. But it, for me, it's not what makes this book powerful. Mm. Story really the story it. in and of itself is powerful enough, and it could be complete fiction, and that's fine with me. Um, there is one question. We may have gotten to it. Everyone remembers the story of racial prejudice in this book, but as I reread it, I rediscover socioeconomic prejudice mm -hmm. and Alexandra's concern mm -hmm. uh, for the background, Jerry's four kinds of folks, etc. cetera. Right. Um, do you think we've made much progress in that? Yeah. Isn't there some place in the book it says like folks are folks, you know, all folks are just mm -hmm. we're all the same, you know, and um, yeah, but I think Jeff, someone makes the point. Someone actually says folks aren't folks. Aren't folks, there's, right? There's, 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 some, there's these classes and yeah. there's this hierarchy, and uh, I want to believe we've made some progress. Mm. I want to believe we've moved in some direction, but uh, I don't know. I, I, it's a great question. I try not to think about it. It's uh, pretty depressing to think that we. We still find ourselves in this class system, um, and I think we do. I, mean, I think we know that. We do and we don't. It's, it's interesting. As I read that question, I thought about the fact of Southern class structure, mm -hmm. which could be easily and was regularly articulated in sort of four types, but not so in the North. There, there was, you know, they we're all Americans, and I think there was never quite the acknowledgement of class structure in the North that there was in the South. And I wonder if that makes a difference these days when we're living with class but there, tensions. But there was a class structure oh, in yeah. the North. Oh, yeah, but not Again, articulated and not recognized. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, if you go back even and read some uh, court decisions, uh, if you go back and read Plessy versus Ferguson, there is a, a specific reference in that court opinion from the Supreme Court that talks about the segregated schools in Boston. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know about you, but we never talked about segregation right. in New England. Right. And yet, in the late 1800s, there's reference to that in this landmark Supreme Court case. Um, and and that's, that's always baffled me. You know, why is there this acknowledgment of what is happening in the South, but somehow the North gets protected in all of this. Right, right. Not only in racial segregation, but even in class conflict. In Kite, right. I think the notion here has always been that there's enough mobility so that people didn't want to talk about it because if they didn't move out of their class, certainly their children would. Would, right. And that's kind of been the myth. So you never want to pick on the upper classes because you're going to be there. Because you want to be there one day, yeah, and yeah. you hope you're going to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think things were a little more rigid, particularly where there's a, a color line. That, that's an inviolate barrier. Um, so it's a wonderful book. It's one that you've chosen. What, how is it going to endure? Do you think this book yeah, remains a classic? You know, I, 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 wonder, um, I wonder if anybody would ever think about remaking the movie. Hmm. Um, I think it would be an interesting thing to think about and to consider and and maybe, maybe take a bit more license 
with the book and maybe modernize it a bit, mm -hmm. what would that look like? Using the same story but and the same characters, but but uh, playing with it a little bit because I think that would be a very interesting thing to think about. I've actually talked to some people about that in various conversations about the book, and the consensus is that Gregory Peck has made that impossible. Yeah. That, but but I think you're right. I think if you try to make it not a period piece, then you then you're sort of out of that trap. There was also a stage production, which I've never I've seen. I've never seen, yeah. Uh, but that might be a place where you could take a little more license, it, right, yeah. and, uh, and explore some of these themes or bring the story forward a little bit. I mean, the sequel would be the, would be the wonderful thing. That's sort of the, why haven't hasn't somebody done that? Yeah, and, uh, you know, whatever happens to Scout. <laughs> Scout. Boo. Yeah. You know, we really want to know what's going yeah. on. I but mean, Scout would be, it would, you know, you could just sort of see how did she grow up? What right, happened? Right. Comes back to revisit. Where as she's writing this to me, that would be how I'd, I'd frame it. As she comes back to do to do the research on this book, book she yeah. comes back to her town. The, the one later. thing I would say about the book is that um, I will be, would be very disappointed to learn that this book is no longer taught. You know, suddenly it lost its mm -hmm. its appeal for teachers to to really assign um, and to analyze with their classes. I think that would be uh, very very sad. I bet the story is just way too strong and way too appealing for teachers to ever to, let yeah. go of this one because kids are going to latch onto it. Yeah. Sue, what a pleasure! Thank you so very much. Thanks for Frank. Much I've for enjoyed it. Us. Thank you. Sue Waslick uh, participated in Duke Reads. This our final program of the season. Thank you for tuning in, our last Duke Reads of 2010-2011. And before closing, I do want to acknowledge the death of Reynolds Price, who until this year always came on Duke Reads. He was one of the program's strongest advocates. His voice, his humor, his brilliance uh, are already greatly missed. Duke University will celebrate his life Thursday, May 19th, 2 o'clock p.m. at Duke Chapel. The event is called A Long and Happy Life, a celebration for Reynolds Price. And the public is invited. Next office hour is Friday, April 22nd. Duke Law Professor Samuel Buell will discuss and take questions from online viewers about white-collar crime. Please tune into that. And if you wish to listen to this Duke Reads session again, just go to Duke On Demand in a day or so. Meanwhile, we will see you next season. Thank you so very much for tuning in to Duke Reads. I'm Frank Stacio.